Hello again, and we're very happy to welcome you back to another Invisible Histories talk and, and very, very happy to have here today with us Ruth Cohen, who's going to talk to us about cooperator Margaret Llewellyn Davies. Ruth did come and speak to us, um, not virtually, at the library a few years ago about Margaret, but since then she's done a lot more research and indeed written a new book, so it's about that that she is going to talk to us today. So delighted to see you back, albeit virtually. It does save your travel though so thanks very much to to Ruth. So our, our events are as usual free and as usual I am just going to put in that plug for the fact that there is a donate button on our website if you uh, feel so inclined. Okay uh, so I am going to share my screen and say over to you Ruth. Okay, is that all right? Is that all how it should be? I'm just making it bigger. There you go. Yes. Okay, well, thanks ever so much, Lynette, for inviting me to come back again and talk about Margaret Llewellyn Davis. I always love coming to the library, and I just really wish that we could be all seeing each other in person. But having said that, Zoom is a brilliant uh, substitute. Um, I'd like to introduce Margaret with something which happened at the end of her career in the Women's Cooperative Guild. In 1922, a year after she retired, she was the first woman ever to chair the huge Co-op National Congress. And this was an amazing accolade at that time. It finally marked acceptance that women could play a full role in the cooperative movement. And it was a far cry from when Margaret started, when I think a lot of cooperators would have agreed with the man who shouted out at her, that rather than go to a guild meeting, his wife should stay at home and uh, wash my moleskin trousers. So that was the sort of attitude at the beginning. Next slide, please. At the Congress, the 1,700 delegates greeted Margaret with a standing ovation. There was some confusion about how to address her though. Should it be Madam President, Lady President, Mrs. President, Mr. Chairman? But in the end, it all went off all right and the cooperative news described her as the best man of the conference, sweet, sympathetic and smart and she was presented with not only an illuminated address but also flowers and chocolates which obviously were considered then as now a super suitable gifts for a lady. However by now Margaret was definitely on the left of the cooperative movement and she pulled no punches in her opening address to the congress and I've given you a little quote here cooperation is far more than a reformist movement we're working for no patchwork modifications no reconciliation of capital and labour. So you get some idea of where Margaret was at in relation to the movement's politics. GDH Cole wrote in his classic history that Margaret's decision to join it was a turning point for cooperation. She, also, she was dedicated to the movement, which she saw as the way forward to socialism and to internationalism. But she also combined it with an enduring commitment to women's rights. And that's what's rather fascinating the way she combines the two. Can have the next slide. So who was this woman? You can see her here more informally. Today I'm going to talk mainly about her work, but there was much more to her and her life than that. Although she was single and childless, she often had to juggle her commitment to the Guild with family responsibilities. Things don't change that much. And especially to her ailing father. But after he died, when she was in her 50s, she lived happily with her co-worker Lillian Harris for the rest of her life, and they were actually devoted companions. Margaret was definitely someone you didn't forget in a hurry. By all accounts, she was a skilled campaigner, vital and persuasive. Indeed, Virginia Woolf said that Margaret could compel a steamroller to waltz. But she was also intensely sociable. And while she loved discussing ideas, especially politics, she also loved music and poetry and nice clothes, preferably in some shade of blue. What's more, she seems to have had a lifelong weakness for terrible jokes, really awful jokes. So I'm going to talk a bit initially about Margaret's background and early life, and then I'll go on to her work in the Guild. At the final section, I'm going to highlight two contrasting campaigns, and I hope this will illustrate how Margaret enabled the Guild to become what the Manchester Guardian called in 1914, probably the most remarkable women's organisation in the world. Next slide. 
Born in 1861, Margaret came from an upper middle class family, which was part of the progressive intellectual elite of the time. And you've got her father and mother here. Her much loved mother came from a Unitarian background and several of her aunts and uncles were positivists. And positivism, among other things, as you might know, taught that working classes played the central role in social development. And it was an influential movement at the time. One uncle, who was a radical lawyer, worked closely with trade unions in the 1860s and 70s. And an aunt married the well-known outspoken positivist, Spencer Beasley, who at various times actually worked with Karl Marx. There's a nice story that when he was engaged, Beasley wrote to Marx that his fiance, that is Margaret's aunt, was heartily sympathetic to with my political and social views. And there's no fear that I'm going to have to become respectable. So this was not exactly a conservative family. On the other side of the family, Margaret's father was a prominent clergyman, but also a Christian socialist and committed to social reform. His sister you may have heard of was Emily Davis, an outstanding mid-Victorian feminist. Overall, it was taken for granted in Margaret's family that you could and should intervene in public affairs, that you had a right to be listened to, and that you had to power, the power to make things happen, even if you were a woman. Next slide, please. Margaret's father, uh, sorry, most unusually for a girl at this time, Margaret had a university level education at the pioneering Girton College, which her aunt Emily Davis had helped to set up. It was the first college to provide women with university level education, though they weren't allowed to actually have degrees. She left Girton early, partly because she was needed at home and partly because it's said that she actually wanted to do something in the world. She was already feeling she had a responsibility to make the world better. Back in London in the early 1880s, she first of all, like many other young women of her class, took up philanthropy. But her ideas soon began to change. She soon discovered William Morris and developed a passion both for his politics and for his art. And the latter influenced her flowing clothes, which she always liked to wear. In 1886, Margaret discovered the cooperative movement. It seems that she was initially influenced by the idea that cooperation could gradually lead to some form of socialism. However, by the time British cooperation, by the time her time, British cooperation had become both extremely successful and intensely respectable, even conservative with a small c. Most cooperators came from better sections of the working class, and the movement was widely seen, as you probably know, as a stronghold of individual self-help which played a part in neutralizing potential class conflict. Can you put the next slide, please? The Rochdale pioneers model of consumer cooperation had really taken off. You can see an example here. Uh, it was centered on local co-op societies, which ran shops in working class communities where members shared profits through a dividend based on the amount that they spent. It wasn't just about individual individualism though, and it wasn't just about saving through the famous divvy, although it was for some people. Uh, cooperation had grown out of early 19th century Owenite socialism, and there was a strong tradition of education and community life. Can you have the next one, please? You can see here a huge anniversary celebration um, at the 21st anniversary of a particular society. There were libraries, reading rooms, festivals, outings, social events, and more. And ideals of collective action still very much survived. And people often refer to the hope that society would eventually be transformed into a cooperative commonwealth. You see that phrase a lot, and I think it really mean, does actually mean something. It was this side of the movement that attracted Margaret. However, Although cooperative women theoretically had equal rights, in practice it was very different. It was men who ran the, the, the movement. It, the women who actually shopped at the stores and managed the family finances did not have a voice at this time. The Women's Cooperative Guild was still there, fairly new and small when Margaret joined, and initially it was careful not to challenge the men. As one speaker put it, our part in cooperation is to be the sunbeams, the encouragers, a very Victorian approach. Within months of joining her local co-op society, Margaret helped to set up a guild branch attached to it, 
Little did she know, but this would provide her with a lifelong home. Next. Unlike Margaret, who was upper middle class, single and comfortably off, most Guild members were working class, home-based wives and mothers living in industrial areas who didn't work regularly outside the home. It was a bit different in Lancashire because there was a different tradition of married women working. And here you can see a group of early members. They were not the poorest, but they did not have easy lives, as I think you can tell from, from looking at these women. Far from it. They had to manage household finances, keep up a respectable home and look after their husband and children. All at this time, an unending, backbreaking struggle. We know from Guild's women's personal stories that when, while some were reasonably prosperous, for others, or indeed for many, when illness or unemployment struck, it was a real battle to make the money last. A wife's wages from casual work, fitted in somehow around everything else she had to do, could be essential. An example is on the slide from leading activist Mrs Layton, who for years had to take in washing and other things when her ailing husband was laid up. But as she said, she never let anyone know how poor she was. Margaret quickly moved up in the Guild. Before long, she was elected onto the governing Central Committee. And then in 1889, when she was only 27, she was elected as General Secretary. That's actually the leader of the Guild a post to which she would be annually re-elected for over 30 years. That same year, in 1889, because of her father's job, the family had moved to the small country town of Kirby Lunsdale in Cumbria. And that, that was a slightly strange place for Margaret to end up. She missed her London life, but the move to the Northwest in the end was very, very positive. She could make links in Corporation's heartland, the northern industrial towns. She travelled around promoting the Guild, getting to know members and learning about their hard lives. And it was a real eye opener to her. Now, can I have slide? Next slide, please. These are some of the women she worked with in the earlier years, and you can see her sitting on the right. While the Guild provided members with a vital social outlet, Margaret insisted it could do more. She believed they could and should play a part, both in the cooperative movement and in the wider public world. In 1892, after just three years as General Secretary, Margaret got the Guild's agreement to this. She introduced a novel programme of education, discussion and campaigning. And although some members were less than enthusiastic, overall this struck a chord. Margaret ran the Guilds for many years, successfully, though somewhat incongruously, from a room in her father's Kirby Lonsdale Vicarage. Next slide, please. And you can see her with her friend Lillian in a really very typical Victorian home office with absolutely loads of papers all over the place. And if you look very carefully, you can see the family dog sleeping by the fire. As time passed, the Guild grew and grew. Its social side continued and it provided a supportive environment in which fun and affection definitely mingled with hard work. Over the years that followed, it empowered women in their thousands. For example, Mrs. Layston's testified, from a shy, nervous woman, the Guild made me into a fighter. Next slide. Indeed, the Guild attracted and nurtured many impressive women, some of whom are in this picture of the 1904 Central Committee. And you can see Mrs. Berry's comment. Mrs. Berry was an ex-mill worker who later became several times president of the Guild and in fact um, crossed swords with Margaret on various occasions. And this was her response. She felt like a war horse hearing the beat of the drum when she first found her, her niche really in the Guild. The Guild provided training, experience and a platform. And some women went on to public service or became active in political groups, trade unions, or in the struggle for the vote. Next, please. And this is Sarah Reddish, who's a very good example. She was from Bolton, she's an outstanding activist in the Guild, started off as a mill worker for quite a number of years, but she also became an organiser for women's trade unionists, unions, and for the suffrage movement. And in her later life, was prominent in setting up maternity services in Bolton. 
By the time Margaret retired in 1921, the Guild had well over 50,000 members nationwide and had become a unique public voice for working class wives and mothers. Although Guild's women didn't always agree, what they shared with one another and with Margaret was a commitment to cooperation as a way to make a better world. So I'm now going to move on to talk about Margaret's campaigning work in the Guild. Margaret always highlighted campaigns which were aimed at influencing the cooperative movement itself. Much of this was concerned with supporting members in challenging the barriers to women's progress in the movement, and especially with helping them to manage to be elected for the male dominated committees which ran the movement. Margaret also increasingly emphasised women's potential power as cooperative shoppers to change cooperation and even the world. Next, please. And you can see this on the banner that she and Lillian presented to the Guild for its 100th anniversary. Cooperative buying builds the whole of the new world. Like other Guild's women, Margaret was particularly concerned to promote ethical trading policies in the movement. So with her in the lead, branches consistently pushed for their local co-op shops to stock what we would call fair trade goods. They also supported policies aimed at making cooperation more accessible to poor people. That was a very interesting campaign, actually. And as we shall see, they battled for better wages and conditions for employees. And it has to be said that this was not always well received by the conservative leaders of the movement at that time. There were also the Guild's external campaigns. Next, please. As Margaret wrote, she saw trade unionism and cooperation as, quotes, two halves of the same circle. And this leaflet, I'm sorry you can't read the detail of it, it illustrates an early attempt to bring cooperators and trade unionists together, and in particular, to persuade women to shop at the co-op and stressing that they should boycott goods produced by bad employers. Many Guild's women shared Margaret's commitment to the union movement, and in several major strikes, the Guild fundraised for the strikers' families. On a different tack, both Margaret as an individual and the Guild as a whole played an active part in the battle for votes for women. I don't think that's something that's often emphasised, really. And Lancashire Guild women, one of them was Sarah Reddish again, were particularly important in an extraordinary mobilisation of northern working class women for the vote, which you may have heard about. Next one, please. This wonderful banner, which comes from the working class movement library, in fact, shows how these radical suffragists, as they became known, linked political rights with equality at work and what they called social fraternity. I guess that would be something about social equality. Um, and I, Lynette tells me that this banner was just lying around in someone's sewing box for many years until Eddie and Ruth Frau discovered it quite by accident. And if you could give me the next slide, please. And this picture, not, I'm sorry, again, not a very good one, but it's, it's a very significant one, is of Lancashire women when they went down to London in 1906 as part of a mass deputation to the Prime Minister demanding the vote. I think they're all wearing ha hats, wonderful hats, with the exception of Sarah Reddish again, and she's in the middle, um, third row, second row, and she isn't wearing a hat. Perhaps Margaret's most high profile campaign was about maternity care and benefits. And after lobbying successfully for Lloyd George to have a maternity uh, grant as part of the Insurance Act, Margaret went on to devise and promote a really influential and groundbreaking scheme for, for what she called the National Care of Maternity. And members, Guild members were, took this up very enthusiastically locally. Next one, please. This is just one of the photos from a book which she edited, which included letters from Guild's women about their problems when they, uh, in terms of maternity. And some of those problems were to do with the enormously enormously but the very large families that uh, many of them some of them had uh, with not enough money to support them in, detail, in more detail about two of margaret's campaigns which i think ring bells even today the first was aimed squarely at the co-op movement 
which employed thousands of people in its shops and other enterprises. Next, please. And here you can see the workers at a co-op shop. In 1906, after years of lobbying, the Amalgamated Union of Co-op Employees, the AUCE, finally got the National Cooperative Congress to endorse a minimum wage scale for employees in the movement. They had a scale because they employed, it was graded by age because they employed young boys and, and as well as men. But it was great that they had uh, got the agreement to the minimum wage scale, but, and it was a huge but, the scale was for boys and men only. Even though girls and women earned lower, considerably lower, sometimes shockingly lower, they were just not included in the scale. Challenging this, though, raised some difficult issues. At this time, many in the labour movement thought men actually should be paid more than women on the basis that they needed a family wage high enough to support the whole household so their wives didn't have to go out to work. On the other side of the argument, equal pay for men and women was already being canvassed at this time. I hadn't known that and I find that rather interesting. This is in the 1900s. And there were also worries that minimum wages might undermine trade union bargaining and that a minimum could effectively end up being the maximum that employers would pay. I think you can see echoes of that these days. Whatever the problems, Margaret took the AUC victory as a wake up call. And when she contacted them, she got them to devise a women's scale, but one which was still lower than the men's. Initially, she accepted that as she believed that equal pay was not a realistic immediate demand in the movement at that time. But interestingly, there was a huge row when she put it to the Guild Congress. Next, please. Speakers lined up to, to oppose her. For example, Catherine Webb, who was actually very prominent and also Margaret's, normally Margaret's close ally, was absolutely furious, as you can see. She saw this as simply exploiting women. Unusually in the Guild, Margaret and the leadership were nearly defeated on this um, and a competing proposal demanding just straightforward equal pay nearly got through and it was very unusual for that to happen. Fortunately, Margaret quickly realised her mistake. She was a skillful tactician. And the following year, she came up with an increased women's scale, though still lower than the men's. But this time she was emphasising that it was a step towards equal pay and it went through with no trouble. Then she immediately started a well-organised campaign in which branches energetically lobbied their local co-op societies to implement the scale. But it was an uphill struggle. Each society made its own decision about wages, and as they were facing price competition from large-scale retailers, many were reluctant to pay more than they had to for their women employees. By 1914, after six years of campaigning, only one in six local societies had agreed the women's scale. Meanwhile, the huge and powerful Cooperative Wholesale Society, the CWS, ran factories and workshops which produced goods for cooperative shops. It employed between five and 7,000 girls and women. So a minimum wage for them would be a real prize. Women cooperators were always being told to display their loyalty by shopping at the co-op and buying CWS goods. But as Margaret declaimed, Managers are in no position to treat peach loyalty to us, for example, to buy cooperative boots, unless they practice loyalty to trade union and cooperative principles in the manufacture of those boots. However, when approached about the minimum wage scale, CWS directors just refused, point blank refused. At the Guild's Congress in 1910, furious delegates unanimously resolved to continue campaigning. Now, the Guild really was on the warpath. Margaret went public about the dispute in co-op news. She persuaded leading cooperators to back the campaign and she made links with sympathetic co-op societies. Next one, please. As you can see here, around the country, Guild's women sprang into action, responding enthusiastically to her call to lobby every single delegate who was going to go to one of the crucial CWS meetings which took place each quarter in each region. And you can see about the, the branch secretary who walked six miles before breakfast and another president and secretary who visited 50 houses in two days. Guildsmen, women really were determined. 
When victory came in December 1912, it was widely publicised and the Manchester Guardian hailed it as, quotes, a triumph for the progressive power of democratic organisation and a vindication of women's capacity for politics. It's estimated that thanks to the Guild, by 1914, over 12,000 girls and women benefited from the minimum wage. The campaign highlights Guild's women's insistence that, as Margaret put it, cooperators should give profits second place to good conditions of labour. And it shows that although most of them no longer worked regularly themselves outside the home, Guild's women insisted that whatever the financial implications, cooperators must pay their workers properly. And I find it rather amazing they even had to do a campaign to, to get this over. A couple of afterthoughts. Despite everything, the Guild did not always have easy relations with the male-dominated AUCE, which had been quite happy to ignore women in its initial campaign for a minimum wage, and even later on seems to have dragged its feet. Despite the large number of girls and women who worked for the co-op, the AUC's first female official was only elected in 1912, and it was not until 1915 that the union appointed its first female organiser, and by the way, that was Ellen Wilkinson, who you'll know as Red Ellen, who went on to be the Labour Minister. More broadly, Margaret's thinking on how to achieve equality was changing. She pointed to women's generally lower standard of living than men's and the entrenched belief that women's labour was just simply worth less. Given all this and more, she thought that equal pay would only be achievable once there had been much broader social and cultural changes. Moreover, given what she knew from Guild's women, she was not only concerned about wages. What about the many home-based women who were completely dependent on their husbands for financial support, not just for themselves, but for the children? Margaret supported various suggestions like the endowment of motherhood, which later became family allowance and child benefit. Um, but she again felt this was not enough. As she wrote, uncharacteristically pessimistic to her friend Bertrand Russell, the more independent women grow, the more they claim from life, the more impossible their problems become. And the other campaign I'm now going to go on to illustrates some of these problems. It was a highly controversial campaign about divorce. Next slide, please. Early in 1910, Margaret was asked to give evidence to a Royal Commission on Reform of the Divorce Laws. At that time, Divorce was out of reach for most working people. It was expensive and cases were only heard in London. And there was a double standard. While a husband had, could get a divorce on grounds of adultery, a wife also had to prove another offence. When Margaret consulted the Guild about all of this, she received overwhelming backing to demand that divorce should be cheaper and that there should be equal rules for men and women. But she wanted to go much further. She also consulted 124 selected Guild officials, that's branch secretaries, that sort of thing, about several more radical proposals, including allowing divorce on the basis of mutual consent, or even on the basis of one partner claiming serious incompatibility. Although these suggestions were obviously much more contentious, over half the officials still supported them. Many wrote back at length, voicing their opinions and giving a total of over 130 detailed case examples of their own and other women's experiences. Their letters were dynamite. They lifted what Margaret later called the thick curtain that falls on married life to reveal women's hidden suffering. And they showed that many girls women actually wanted radical changes to the divorce laws, which people would not have thought at that time. Next one, please. When she appeared at the Royal Commission in November 1910, Margaret organised her evidence around the letters, reading out many case examples and supplying more in, a, more in a written appendix. She did acknowledge that a small minority of Guild's women were opposed to divorce on religious grounds, but she also pointed out that others actually supported divorce on more or less the same grounds, as you can see in that very first quote there, that it's not a marriage in the sight of God if men and women are not real comrades. Some of the writers too quoted cases where they believed that only divorce would enable the mother to bring up the children in a loving and moral in environment. 
And above all, as you can see on the slide, there was the overall point that Guild's women wanted to get rid of the idea that a man owns his wife just as he does a piece of furniture. Next, please. Margaret read out some shocking examples of domestic abuse to the assembled commissioners. With her, she brought Eleanor Barton, who was a tough and experienced branch secretary from Sheffield, with the idea she could give direct evidence more from the grassroots than Margaret could. Both alluded, if indirectly, to rape within marriage, as you can see from the quotes on the slide. And as one woman graphically testified, you can't imagine what it's like unless you go through it to feel simply a convenience to a man. Both Margaret and Eleanor Barton stressed that married women's lack of independent income was a crucial additional factor. As Eleanor pointed out, a married working woman in the home has no money of her own at all, and that makes it very hard for women to escape from any amount of cruelty. Reforming the divorce laws alone was not going to be enough. It took a couple of years for the Royal Commission to report, but when it did, Margaret faced a completely unexpected backlash. Perhaps inevitably, the Commission had ended up divided. Its majority report did recommend reforms, but an influential minority report, very much associated with the Church of England, singled out Margaret and the Guilds for virulent attack, claiming that they did not have backing for their opinions and that they advocated a facility of divorce hitherto unheard of in any civilised country. They'd obviously really struck a nerve. In an angry response, Margaret stressed that she and Eleanor had been elected and were putting forward Guilds women's opinions. She pointed out that the officials who wrote to her, quotes, belonged to the workers themselves and it is to such as they that intimate tragedies are confided by other women of their own class. And she added, angrily, the views of independent, intelligent women cannot be stifled. Unfortunately, it wasn't all quite as simple as this. Divisions were now emerging within the Guild itself. Darwin, its, large branch, its largest branch, had unprecedentedly dissociated itself from any Guild campaign for divorce reform, and some members in other branches were clearly really uncomfortable about discussing divorce. It made them really embarrassed. Outright opposition surfaced dramatically when Margaret put her proposal to the Guild's Annual Congress in 1913. Next. You can see that, that year's Congress here. A local branch threw down the gauntlet, submitting an amendment opposing Margaret's proposal about, uh, for divorce on grounds of mutual consent, which was about the most controversial one. Their amendment was only defeated by an unnervingly small margin. Moreover, nearly a third of the 600 or more delegates had not voted at all. The Guild was split. But then there was an extraordinary series of events and divorce became the catalyst for something much bigger as far as the Guild was concerned. Early in 1914, the Salford Catholic Federation wrote to the United Board, which was effectively the executive committee of the cooperative movement, and they threatened that Catholic cooperators might resign en masse unless the Guild stopped its campaign for easier divorce. Fearful of division, the Board conceded, but then the Guild itself refused to budge. They were not prepared to give up the campaign. This was very serious. The Board held the purse strings for a £400 annual grant to the Guild, and some of its members already disapproved of the Guild's independent campaigning, believing that it should stick to spreading cooperation rather than taking up controversial issues like divorce and votes for women. As one man said, if the board had to pay the piper, they should be able to call the tune. Another said it would be a mistake to allow the women to go on agitating. In May 1914, the board decided to give an ultimatum. It would withdraw the grant unless the Guild stopped the divorce campaign and in future only took up work of which the board approved. What no one quite expected was Guild's women's reaction. When the board's ultimatum was debated at the Guild's Congress, Cooperative News reported women's fury at this threat to their independence. Next, please. You can see some of this here. And the women are saying they want to work with the men side by side, which was a very common 
uh, demand. They didn't want just to be treated as subordinates and told what to do. And they were actually preferred, prepared, in fact, preferred not to have the grant and to go on being independent. In the end, the United Board's ultimatum was overwhelmingly rejected by the Congress to loud and prolonged cheering. And what's really amazing is that suddenly the details of divorce reform seem to stop being controversial. Margaret wrote to a friend that, that the debate was primarily about women's autonomy. And that was what the women really uh, were, were arguing for. She was overwhelmed by the girls' women's strength and unity and said, I feel the women have now arrived and they will never go back. Somehow, in the course of all this, the heated opposition to Margaret's proposals for divorce reform had dissipated. And even though Gill's women did not all agree to all her proposals for reform, they did back the divorce campaign as a whole. Looking back, the divorce campaign was never going to win. Margaret's advanced proposals for reform were way ahead of their time. In fact, there wasn't any divorce reform until as a small bit of it in 1923. But the girls' evidence of the Royal Commission was really important in my view. It shone a much needed light on previously hidden abuse and confounded contemporary assumptions and even assumptions now about the views of the girls' respectable wives and mothers. As part of the campaign, Margaret even published her evidence and so it provides a unique platform and in public for working class women to tell their experiences in their own words. She'd used the same approach a few years later in the campaign to maternity, for maternity care to great effect. My, finally, I think the story of the campaign is, illustrates the important point that you shouldn't see Guild's women as homogenous, uh, which is what people tend to do. Women in the Guild thought this or they thought that. In fact, of course, uh, it was a healthy organisation which contained various currents of opinion and at times there were really strong differences but when it was important, they could be united. Before I finish, I'll mention briefly what Margaret did after 1921, which was the year she retired from the Guild. A pacifist and an internationalist, she was instrumental in setting up an international women's cooperative guild. She also admired Lenin and the Bolshevik revolution, and she chaired the Society for Cultural Relations with the USSR for several years in the 1920s. But she also remained a committed pacifist, even during the Second World War, and she died in 1944 at the age of 82. Just a couple of points to conclude. The ideas Margaret grew up with shaped her in instinctive combination of feminism and what I think we'd probably call ethical socialism. She was sort of along the lines of the ILP in a way. And it was her upper middle class background, at least in part, which gave her the self-confidence to take on the job of the Guild's national leader at the age of 27 and to create wide ranging networks and alliances and to stand up to those in power, whether within the cooperative movement or outside. Lastly, it's worth emphasising that Margaret and the grassroots Guild's women found each other in the right place at the right time. Next slide, please. In the changing climate of the 1880s and 90s, Guild's women were becoming, were becoming more and more ready for a leader like Margaret, who would move the organisation towards social and political action. Under her influence, it became a natural home for working class women activists who shared her ideals and commitment. And despite the, the difference in social class, she too found a political and personal home in the Guild. As Russian revolutionary Alexandra Kolontai declared when she visited, the Guild gave the lie to the accepted wisdom that housewives could not be politicised. And Margaret's vision was a central element in achieving this. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ruth. We have a, we have a tradition of, of thumbs ups and, and, and applauses if you know, if you know where to hit that reaction button or you can see <laughs> you can now see people doing that as well so 
that's great. Uh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, folks. And we've, we've got 46 people now. So we've, we've, uh, we've uh, um, acquired people along the way. Any of you who missed the start, we're, we will be recording this and it will be going up on our YouTube channel later. Uh, we'll, we'll give you the, the details so you can catch up with it. Uh, but now, um, if people would like to ask questions or, or make comments, if you want to use the chat feature, the, um, which is down on the bottom of my screen, um, there are the, there's the opportunity for you to ask a question there uh, and uh, I can relay that to Ruth if you want to ask a more complicated question you want to try waving at me I'll try and unmute you is there anybody who who would like to ask a question or make a comment I will kind of scroll through you a bit um, see whether I can see anybody Wow, look, you've answered all the questions, Ruth. That's amazing. I've answered it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, um, I can't see anybody waving. Oh, right. Now, somebody, somebody's asking, all oh, right. Yes, Ian is, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you a bit. Somebody's asking about the photos, whether they'd be able to share those. I guess, yes, copyright wise, that's an interesting one. <laughs> uh, I think it should be okay. I mean, I, I didn't got the copyright permission the only thing is I got copyright permissions for the book and I don't know whether that means it's copyright for anyone else I think the ones about the movement I would think are mostly fine um, because uh, some of the ones of the guild I took from a couple of histories which were published way back one of which was edited by Margaret herself and there's no way of actually identifying the, the photographer so those ones I think should be okay the ones of the family um, well, I'm not sure, they should be okay too, but I think if somebody, I don't know, I think possibly I ought to wait and ask the publishers. Yes, I, th I, th I think the, yes, it, I mean, it, it, it depends if you, you're sort of talking about sh showing them to a mate on your phone or, or wanting them for your own talk as well, really, doesn't it? So, so it depends on, on the context, but yes, I think if, it, the, if your copyright cleared by your publisher doesn't, doesn't, um, go go as far as anybody else uh, yeah. sadly or as just as well possibly depending on your point of view yeah somebody wanted if there's somebody really wanted yeah to yeah yeah we've got some we've got some questions going through and i'm not going to lose sight of of, of ian who was waving at me uh okay. but we have got some did married cooperators get their own divvy uh, well that was a that was part of the problem um that in some in when this issue about what they call open membership in a lot of societies, um, at the beginning certainly, um, th there could be only one member per family and that was usually the man. Um, but having said that, um, I think that what normally happened was that women in effect got the, the divvy because there was a terrific um, row at one point when a judge said that a wife's savings belonged to the husband and it was said that this might apply to um, the divvy. So uh, I think what may have happened is the women were the ones that went to the shops, even if they weren't the member, they would get paid the divvy. Um, but I'm not an expert on that. But cert because certainly there was a big, um, it was sort of fizzled out in the end, but there was a lot of worry, I think 1907, that this judgment was going to mean that women weren't going to be able to keep the divvy, which they used, the women used it because they were responsible for, for finances. The women absolutely used it, you know, for when times were hard and for, for budgeting, it wouldn't be the men. Uh, did the Guild discuss the Labour Representation Committee and the Labour Party, and what did Margaret think? Um, Margaret was always pro the Labour Party. The, the, the Labour Party. I don't think they I'm trying to think, I should know this, I'm sorry. They did discuss it. Um, uh, she was certainly, she was certainly for it. Um, I don't think it was, it was never a sort of major thing um, in the Guild. And that's partly because there were real, not splits, but there were different currents in the Guild. There were a lot of socialist women who, you know, were probably active um, in labour movement organisations as well. But there were also quite a lot who were either liberal or not political at all. Um, so I, it wasn't something they took up as a guild, certainly. They might have discussed it and debated it. Okay, uh, Ian, I'm gonna try and unmute you here so you can ask your question. So it's usual thing of really not wanting to let me do that. There, no, 
I, I, I put it there. Jane, can you see if you can unmute Sue and Ian's iPad? I'm really not wanting to do that. While Jane's trying to unmute you, I'll ask you another question that's come through on the chat. How did Margaret come to the notice of Virginia Woolf? Oh, <laughs> well, that, that's a whole story. Um, Margaret was very well connected in the way that posh, posh left-wing intellectuals were in those, that time. And in fact, I think her father um, had some connection, had tutored Virginia Woolf's fa father, and the families knew each other. But then the, what happened was that when Virginia Woolf uh, married Leonard Woolf, Leonard Wolf was very interested, he was a socialist and he was very, very interested in cooperation. And Margaret really was quite crucial in, in, um, in introducing him, giving him introductions with, to the co-op movement. And she and he became quite close in terms of their work. And they just became friends all together, although there was a lot of complications. Virginia Woolf didn't really like Margaret that much. Um, Virginia, and she's written some sort of fairly negative things about her, although she also respected and admired her as well. But she, they just, they were sort of chalk and cheese, really. Um, and you, there, you know, I could have written half the book about their relationship because Virginia Woolf writes all these diaries and letters. You know? <laughs> but yeah, they, they, and so it was, it was through initially through family, but then it was through, through the cooperative movement that she got to see them a lot and she did a lot of work with Leonard Woolf. Okay, thank you. We, we finally managed to, to, to unmute Ian. Go for it, Ian. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I have to say um, that I know uh, quite a lot more, thanks to Ruth, uh, about uh, uh, Margaret Llewellyn Davis and the uh, Women's Cooperative Movement. But one of the few places I've come across it was um, in uh, um, Labour Leader, the ILP paper, in uh, 1914. All right. Um, in the midst of the the, 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 the um, divorce uh, campaign that Ruth was talking about, where the, um, the, the this is a second of July, if anybody wants to look it up, um, the the um, there was a report that uh, the Women's Labour League had, mm. um, I think that's what it was called, um, mm. had uh, passed what was described as a very cordial motion congratulating. Uh, the the, um, the guild on its resistance to the attempt by you know the male dominated board that uh, Ruth was describing to uh, stop it uh, uh, you know by by holding on to the 400 quid which of course was a lot of money in those days um, and um, uh, but I, I mean I think I I've, my understanding was when I looked it up, was that, that um, uh, what they were, the, the position they'd arrived at, or one of the positions they'd arrived at by then, was that there should be, um, uh, divorce should be available after two years separation. Uh, do you know anything about that, Ruth? I think that was, that, I think that was part of the mutual consent um, uh -huh. round that Margaret was, was, was advocating, which people did find quite shocking. But, and mm. I think that the, the two year separation was sort of rolled into that one. Um, yeah. I'm very interested that the Women's Labour League had uh, congratulated the Guild there. That's, um, I'll try and look that up at some point. That's, uh, yeah. that's great. Get that in the second edition of the book with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice, really nice to know, you know. So is it, Harriet says, is there any connection with the Thrain and Daly Davis family associated with J.M. Barry, or is it simply that they're sufficiently common Welsh surnames to be frequently combined? Yes, I mean, Margaret just seems to have been connected with everybody. <laughs> and the, the little boys, uh, you know, the, the lost boys, uh, they were her nephews. And she did, in fact, um, she knew Barry. It, basically, she was the only daughter. There were six brothers and she was unmarried and I think out of love but also out of accepted duty she was the one that they turned to when things went wrong so when the little boy's parents father particularly Margaret's brother got ill Jay and Barry was already associated with the family but basically Margaret was called on she left her guild work she went down looked after the little boys while Jay and Barry was up in London um, sort of supporting and paying for I think the, the husband and uh, Arthur and Sylvia, um, if you've ever read the books. So yes, she was, that is the, the connection. She was very much connected with the, 
that they were her nephews and she did do a certain amount of looking after them before um, they, and even after they were with J.M. Barry, she, she kept in touch with them as a sort of, you know, Aunt Margaret figure. Uh, Anne-Marie says, you included some articles that Margaret wrote for the Co-op News. Did she contribute articles to other newspapers or periodicals at the time? Um, not very much that I know of. She did a bit. I, she certainly did some uh, occasional article in Labour Leader that I've seen. Um, but it wasn't mainly she, she and I haven't come across a lot, a lot her, her writing much anywhere else. But I would, certainly I think she was a dedicated reader of the Labour Leader. I think at, at times she she oh, at times she would submit an article, for example, to one of the suffrage papers when she was trying to persuade them to change their mind about what their policy should be on the vote. She would then put an article in as sort of as a uh, as part of her campaign, but she wasn't a regular contributor. Okay. Uh, Andrea says, can you tell us a bit more about Margaret's international work? Were the connections to Germany, France or other European countries? Um, well, I can tell you a li the little bit I know is that she um, was certainly had links with Belgium because they, she went over there and, and uh, uh, they, it was they that partly gave her the idea for some of the maternity um, proposals that she made. Um, to be honest, I don't know. She, she got very, she was always an internationalist and she was always, they used to invite people to come to the Congress. My memory isn't of any German people except, except of course, um, Emmy Freundlich. She got very, there was a wonderful woman called Emmy Freundlich from Vienna, who, who she got very involved with in setting up the International Women's Co-op Guild. Um, but also, I think, in the, in the peace movement, because Margaret was a pacifist during the First World War, um, and she had to tread a bit carefully because not everybody in the Guild would have supported her. But I think, I'm trying to think when Emmy Freundlich, I think it was um, after the war, particularly when, you know, when there was um, starvation in Vienna, uh, Emmy Freundlich came over. And then they worked very closely in the International Guild. But I, that, I don't know anything about the organisational side, I'm afraid. There's a, a good follow-on question for that when you talk about the First World War. What, what was her role? Did her pacifism give her problems in the Guild? Yes. Um, this, basically, Margaret herself was already a pacifist. She supported, but she was very aware that within the Guild, although in fact they passed resolutions, they passed resolutions for a negotiated peace. Um, for most of the war, they were prepared to go for that. They weren't absolute pacifists, but it was, it was again, there, was, there were dis differences within the Guild and, and it was, she, she had to kind of keep them on board. And the way I read it is that she also, she, I should say also that her father, who died in 1916, um, she probably thought was worried about being too publicly associated with something like the No Conscription Fellowship um, in, uh, while he was alive. But in terms of the Guild, I think, I think it did, she had to be very careful about it. And she was very devastated. I think it was the 1918 Congress where she actually lost a resolution um, for a, a peace resolution. And some of it, I think at that point was that she had actually miscalculated how to, she'd lost her, her uh, skill at, at how to keep them along with her. But I think it's also that, yes, there, 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 was, there were some horrible things later on in the war, particularly horrible letters and speeches by some of the, you know, the more jingoistic, well, not necessarily jingoistic, but women who are absolutely outraged at the Guild should be taking any kind of peace line. So yeah, she, they, they, they went so far, but she couldn't, she herself went much further. She was involved, I think she's on the executive of the um, Union for Democratic Control or Union of Democratic Control. And she was also associated, but not very publicly with the, no conscription fellowship. Both organisations of which we have some great material about in the library. Oh, wow. so, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, I'd like to look at it sometime. Um, who was her uncle, the radical lawyer? Um, he was her uncle Harry. He would have been Harry Crompton. Okay. Right. Um, That's a, that, was a, that was an easy one. <laughs> Sorry. Great mate of Spencer Beasley, who's and they got they got attacked in the press for 
for saying things like, you know, that the, they, they should, that Fenian, as they call it, prisoners shouldn't be treated so badly, and uh, opposing Governor Eyre, who massacre in Jamaica, if you know about that, um, Morant Bay massacre. So they, they were sort of progressive lawyers, and he worked with the TUC, I think, at that time. Interesting family with all these connections are uh, fantastic. No, no wonder you've you've written another book. It's, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's that's the question so far on the chat. If anybody else wants to wave at me, right? Yes, I'm going to try and unmute Elaine. I'm really not happy about doing this. Oh, there you go, Elaine. You're unmuted. Hello. Um, thanks for a great talk, Ruth. Um, you talked about equal pay. Um, and said that it was being discussed in the 1900s. Um, I've looked at the Owenite socialists of the um, 1820s and 1830s, mm. and they were talking about equal pay then. Um, in fact, the, um, I think it was the Tayloresses. There's a wonderful chapter in Barbara Taylor's book, Even the New Jerusalem, where the women complain that they'd love equal pay, but the men are as bad as the masters in denying them that. So I wonder, um, have you found any sort of connections? Um, it's talked about in the 1900s, you know, is anything happening between the sort of 1820s and 30s and going forwards? Um, yeah. Maybe that's, you know, that's a kind of huge scope of study in itself, but, um, that idea of equal pay was certainly there yes. um, amongst those Owenite socialists, yeah, women, yeah. yeah. Well, there, there were so, so many advanced ideas around then, weren't there, with the Owenites? And I, I, it would be wonderful to know quite how, whether that did kind of carry through, because a lot of their ideas seem to have got a bit lost or changed, I suppose. I don't know what would have happened in the 1830s, 40s and going on. Um, I don't know, I just came across it in the context of this particular um, discussion in the Guild and I just thought it didn't seem to fit somehow with, I suppose, the late Victorian Edwardian sort of world I was looking at. But, you know, perhaps it was there all the time, I don't know. Okay, um, Cathy has, uh, has the question, we would expect Cathy to ask, is there much known about Margaret's relationship with Mary MacArthur, Cathy's particular uh, field of interest? Um, yes, I, I'm sure there is, and I, it, I haven't got it at the front of my mind because Mary MacArthur certainly comes up. I think, but I can't, I can't really say anything much because she didn't, you know, there was so much in this uh, world that I had to kind of go in certain directions. But um, yes, I'm sure that they knew each other. Did you know, um, did you come across Margaret? At, when, no. I, I'm, I'm sure I found a reference somewhere, whether it was a social reference, mm -hmm. Or whether it was something else, I, I don't know. Am I on? Yes. Yes. No, I haven't found her much either. So I was just one, wondering whether whether what you'd got from your side, but perhaps we'll have to have a talk about that at a later time. Yes. Yes. Really yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank yes. you. So if you're going on to YouTube to to um, catch up on today's talk, you can the very first one, which is on YouTube, is is uh, Kathy's talk about about Mary yes. McCarthy. Yes. Uh, so, what was her relationship with Sarah Reddish? Another question. Um, well, that's another interesting one. Sarah Reddish, um, when Margaret was living in Kirby Lonsdale, um, and she became very overworked, and Kirby Lonsdale's not far from Bolton, um, and they, they employed Sarah Reddish initially to be guild organiser, to take some of the work off Margaret in about 1892 or three. And so they did actually work together for a couple of years, um, it's interesting to know what that relationship might really have been like. There is some, there's some wonderful letters from Margaret's mother to Margaret um, talking about Sarah Reddish and she starts off being rather um, snobbish. I mean, she was a judge's daughter herself, you know, she had servants. But then she really, there's one point where she says, what a good thing she is, so much more of a lady than many by birth. And uh, so there, there was, Sarah Reddish was having to kind of fit into this, this world when she went there to work as organiser. And she didn't take up the invitation to stay on as organiser after the couple of years. But uh, Margaret wrote a, a very, very um, sort of eulogistic obituary for 
in, in co-op news for Sarah Reddish. But it would be interesting to know what they, how they actually got on or whether perhaps they just didn't. And they just, I would imagine they both, she always spoke of Sarah Reddish with great respect. She always, at various times, she would ask, Sarah Reddish went on to have various positions in the Guild and Margaret would ask her to start to open a debate where she needed a good person to open it, you know. So I think that there was no actual clash, but I don't think they were, it wasn't a wonderful cross-class friendship or anything, I don't think. So another, another uh, one that pops through in the chat. So we're, we're wind, winding up, but if you've got anything you really want to ask, please, please put it in there. So Martin's asking, can you say anything about Margaret's Welsh family connections? Were her connections to Wales at all important to her? Um, I think the answer is no. Um, her father came from a, a Welsh family. Um, in fact, it was Davis. I mean, they often, all of them get referred to as Davis. It's just that the Llewellyn bit was her father's second name and it got taken up by the rest of the family. And um, there's no sense in which it appears that, that uh, being Welsh was, was important. I don't think he ever lived in Wales, even her, even her grandfather who died young was a churchman. I don't think that, that, that it really, it wasn't a, a significant thing that I've discovered. Certainly. I'm sure actually not, unfortunately. So, sorry if that's a disappointment to the <laughs> to the questioner. But, um, yeah, 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 yes, you, you, yes, you, you, you could only report it, Ruth. It's not, not your fault. <laughs> um, right. Have we got any final questions? I'm going back to gallery view in case anyone's going to wave at me. We have covered a lot and discovered a lot, as we always do. It's uh, the invisible histories title is a fantastic portmanteau term, but it always becomes correct because there's so much to learn about uh, these extraordinary people okay i think we are going to go to a close with some more virtual calls coming through from frank and uh, thank you very much indeed ruth you haven't actually plugged the book it's it's from Mer merlin press do you want to tell us a bit more um it's published by Mer merlin press this year and it's called uh, margaret Llewell llewellyn davis with women for a new world but if you just put in Margaret Llewellyn Davis, you'll find it. And you should be able to get um, bookshops to order it, or it is available on the Merlin website. Yeah, I, I, we've, uh, when I put the YouTube link up on the, the event link on the webpage, I'll, I'll add in, because I don't think I put that up yet, I'll, I'll add in the link so that you can get direct uh, from Merlin Press. So also, thank I would, you. Yeah, I would suggest book, bookshops as well. You know, you thank you good, good yeah. point good point yes yeah yeah so we've got lots of appreciative messages coming through here uh russo that's uh that's absolutely great we uh, we, we do appreciate uh, uh your time and your expertise to, to share with us that's that's terrific and uh thank you to everybody who's participated and asked really good questions uh, we hope to see you if possible at uh, the same time next week it's our last talk before summer break, and it's going to be um, so Wednesday, the 29th of July, two o'clock, when this pain is going to talk to us about another book called Red Lives, which is a new book which is being published um, about uh, different Communist Party members, uh, small biographies, which is all linked to to the Communist Party centenary, which is uh, which is being celebrated this summer, uh, and that's published on the 1st of August. So we're getting a bit of a sneak preview uh, at, at next week's talk. So thank you very much indeed. A reminder that we've recorded this talk and it's going to be going up on our YouTube channel. So if you missed the start or you want to share it with people, it's youtube.com forward slash WCM library. And another reminder that if you feel moved to donate to the library, there's a donate button on our website. Uh, that would be delightful. Um, but otherwise, we would say thanks again very much, particularly to Ruth, but to all of you. And as I always say, take care in solidarity. All the best from everyone at the Working Class Movement Library. Thank you.